The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bill Ayler. Uh, Bill is um, uh, at Aerospace Corporation, where he's the uh, head of the Center for Orbital and Recovery Debris. Um, so, but um, questions about UARS have to be asked during the break. That's what I did. Uh, <laughs> but um, that's not what he's here to talk about. Bill has been uh, actually a, a lead organizer in a series of uh, of meetings uh, which he took the initiative of in planetary defense. And uh, so he's been uh, coordinating and leading these uh, uh, workshops or, or conferences for the last several, well, last several years, uh, which have uh, looked at the whole issues of planetary defense uh, from soup to nuts as an international activity. Um, some fine reports and conference proceedings have come out of it. and. Uh, we've asked him to come here today to talk about that subject because obviously it's very closely related to the whole concept of moving an asteroid, although if it's really only two meters, they probably won't be concerned about it, but uh, it's still uh, all these relevant technologies and scientific issues that go into it. Bill. Okay, thank you. Hey, Lou. <laughs> A little dance there. Okay, well, you know, first, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, the, you're trying to bring asteroids toward us. I think what we were talking about in these conferences is getting them away from us. So slightly different perspective, but, but I think there's uh, some technology transfer that would be very useful um, if there's some clever techniques that uh, are uh, developed by a team like this to actually do, to move an asteroid one way or the other. It's certainly something that would, I think, play a role in planetary defense. Okay, so. Um, what I'm going to do is just kind of give you an overview of the planetary defense area, and you can think about this. And again, there may, there may be some use for this in the, in the future, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but we've had conferences beginning 2004. Uh, that was down in Anaheim. Uh, 2007 was in D.C. 2009 was in Spain, and 11 was in uh, Bucharest, Romania. And so what, what we talk about there is, as you say, is basically everything. I mean, there are issues, there are political issues and policy issues that are uh, as as tough to work as the engineering aspects of planetary defense. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but you know, again, we, we'd have to make a decision to spend a lot of money with some years ahead of time to actually be, actually be able to do some planetary defense type work. And making a decision like that uh, is not going to be a trivial thing to do. Um, as I say, the videos, the videos are available on a couple of the conferences and at the uh, website you see there. And um, I'll talk about some of the highlights from our last meeting shortly. So let's talk a little bit about the threat, and I've just got a few little videos. Uh, this was a, basically a, let's see if I can get this thing to go here. Ah, there it is. Okay, this is, I hope it'll show up. It did earlier. It did. I think it's a communist trick. Okay. <laughs> no. Well, basically, I can just tell you a little bit about uh, that one. That was a... Um, uh, and a, uh, one that was, it looked very much like a, a, a uh, spacecraft reentry. If you remember what those things looked like, they're long, they're long slow things, kind of grow across the sky. That one went right across the sky, towards, across the Midwest, and basically landed a big blob on a car in New York City, which some people thought was an appropriate thing to do with it. Um, this, is, this is another one. Let's see if this will work. No, communist trick. I actually have the videos, so we can, I can sh when we get finished here, I'll go back and show them to you. So don't let me forget that. But you're mentioning a two meter uh, asteroid. This one, the one that, uh, this particular one is Park Forest 2003. And basically what it shows is a, a, a police, vi police car video. A car was, police car was parked on the side of the road. And it's taking, taking a real time video of, of a two meter asteroid coming in. And uh, it blows up above the ground and, sh and sort of showers the earth below with some debris. And there's a nice picture here of uh, one of those pieces of debris that went through a, a roof that's looking up at the hole in the roof and then there's a police officer holding a, a fragment from that. So that was a two meter asteroid. And then of course, you know, we've had some bigger ones in 2000, uh, excuse me, 1908. Tunguska is a fairly famous one. That's one where the air, it was an air, bus, air burst of something believed to be about 30 meters in diameter. 
uh, at about six kilometers altitude, uh, equivalent to a, a two to 15, I think that's probably a little large these days, but uh, you know, multi-megaton explosion. Uh, there were a couple of deaths because that was the only, th they were the only two people living in the area and it leveled uh, uh, and ignited 2,000 square kilometers of forest. And if you look on that lower picture there, that uh, shows the size of that blast relative to s some major metropolitan areas. So the message from this is that, you know, we think a lot about the dinosaur killers, the really big guys, but uh, there's growing recognition that the smaller ones also represent a problem and we need to be thinking about those as well and that they're much more frequent in their impacts. Uh, let's see, and, and the second one is one that um, uh, was reportedly in Brazil, again a multi-megaton explosion, very remote area and uh, there's very little information on that one. Um, let's see, I was going to show another video here which I'll show at the end, but there's a, a very nice video that was done by uh, an astronomer, uh, or actually he's not an astronomer, but he was working at, a, uh, at an observatory and it shows the history of asteroid discovery since uh, 1980. And that's, it's on the web as well. You can find it on YouTube if you'd like. Just type in uh, Scott Manley and ARMA or, um, or uh, Near Earth Objects or something like that and you'll be able to find it. Uh, but this basically is a summary here and the idea here is that, uh, just kind of watch this as we click through it. This is what we knew about asteroids here and you'll see some appear sometime. Ha, there's 1900 so we knew about more of them. And then um, 1950, 1990, uh, 1999, uh, and 2006. I think that's probably the last one. And uh, his, his go out through 2000, April of 2011. So that's much more current and there are a lot more out there. The bottom line is that these things have been out there forever. Uh, we just haven't been looking. And the red ones in here are those that, that are um, earth crossing. So those potentially could be a hazard to us sometimes. And um, you see some estimates on the right side about uh, so how many potentially hazardous objects there might be. And then uh, some of these new surveys are likely to find a lot more. And this is basically shows the detection um, history here as well. And you can get an idea about, the, you know, we're beginning to understand where the, the large objects are that are, are, would, would threaten us. But, you know, as we look more, we're finding more and more of these small ones. And so again, those are the ones that are more frequent and things we need to think about. And as I think Don Yeoman said this morning, uh, the comets are a smaller percentage of that. Okay, so again, now, w w I'm, I'm an engineer. I, I got into this because uh, we, um, where I work, uh, you know, we support the Air Force's space program. And um, the Air Force gets taskers now and then to see if it's ready for dealing with threats of various kinds. And somebody came in with a tasker that says, okay, there's an asteroid headed for Earth. What are you, Air Force, going to do about it? And so they brought a small team of us together to try to figure this out and uh, it really was clear that we didn't have a clue about uh, how to do anything with this stuff. And that was back in 2003, so that's what was, the, uh, was really the beginning for the, of the conference. So I figured a good way to keep us informed about what the state of the art is, is to bring the best people in the world together to talk about this and see where we are on a periodic basis. And so we've had the conferences to do that ever since. Now, as, a, as an engineer and trying to deal with something like this, I mean, if you're going to deflect or even if you're going to try to move something, one thing you have to realize is that, you know, they're, they're not little spheres. They're, they're odd-looking odd things and they tumble and they rotate and so forth. So if you're going to track, attach something to it to move it, that can be a challenge for you. The one on the right actually has a moon. And so uh, the message there is, I mean, you may try to go out and deflect the main body, but find out there's a moon nearby that actually could cause you trouble too. So uh, there are a number of uncertainties associated with this problem. And uh, from the engineering or deflection or potentially the um, ability to move a, a body like this, it may be a, a quite a challenge. So the sizes that cause problems for us, you can get a feel from this one. Uh, these, uh, again, the two meters one's really not a, not a big deal, but you can see that as far as the frequency of these things go, um, they're much more frequent for the small size. And again, they don't threaten the planet uh, when you get to the small ones, but they certainly th threaten a city. So something to think about. The, uh, so how likely is an impact? And I thought this is kind of an interesting way to present it. Basically, the probability of dinosaur killer is about one in a million this century. Uh, of a civilization ending impact is about one in a thousand this century. It may seem a tad high. The probability of small of a Tunguska class is about one in ten this century. And so, again, for people who are early in their careers in this business, it's really not unlikely, not unlikely, I guess is the way to put it, that um, uh, we may need some help from you to do, deal with uh, one of these smaller objects uh, this century. And I just thought I'd give you some uh, ideas about what might be coming. Uh, this, uh, there, there are a few of them. There's, uh, 
uh, asteroid, uh, well, Apophis, I'm sure you've heard about that one. That one has uh, dropped in significance, I guess, over, over time, which is a good thing, because that's a fairly big object. Uh, that has about a 1 in 250,000 chance of impacting Earth in 2036. You can see the uh, trajectory as that one comes close to us in uh, 2029. And um, so basically it gets, gets bent by its close approach with Earth, and depending on how much it get bent, gets bent, it'll, it'll be back in visit in 2036, potentially impacting. And there are things like, um, uh, let's see, keyholes that these things go through that Rusty Schweikart, who's here, can talk more about than I can. But basically, there are little tiny regions of space where, in fact, if it goes through that little tiny region, it'll come back and, and hit us in a future, at a future time. Bill, just, to, just to make it a little more pointed, sure. uh, 2011 AP5 is uh, 2040, by the way. OK. And the probability is now 1 in 625. Ah, going up. Interesting. That's 140 meters, so I think you can see that those are the sizes that we really need to be worried about. So again, as we, as we watch these kind of things, it'd be interesting to see uh, or have you think about what is, the, what is the probability where you would think that we ought to try to do something about it? And how would you present that if your job was to go before Congress and present it as a threat? How would you go, what would you say to them to say, okay, yes, we need to spend, you know, some large amount of money and get started now, and the question's going to come back, you mean, um, well, you know, maybe, what would you say the probability is? One in 625. So, one, so 624 times out of that, it's going to miss the planet. But that you need to get started doing something now or sometime in the future. And again, I think that's really one of the challenges that we face. But you can see the, uh, uh, the uh, energy equ equivalent of those things, and uh, uh, that particular one would be equivalent to about a 100 megaton blast. So these are definitely not significant, insignificant. Okay, and I thought this was kind of an interesting one. It's, it actually will play. This, this one is um, a, an asteroid that went by Mars uh, back in early 2008, and um, it was discovered a couple of months before. And you can see that's about a 50 meter in diameter one. N initial probability of uh, Mars impact was one in about 350. It increased to one in 75, then it went to one in 25, and then late January of the next year, it went to uh, one in 10,000. And so this kind of gives you an idea about how the probabilities may vary as we go forward. And again, I think that's one of the challenges we face is trying to make this, uh, trying to have people understand what the risk is and when it's time to do something. Um, this asks, talks about how much warning we might have. And again, the idea is if you, you want to get it up to a really um, high, high chance of impacting, it'll take you a number of years to get that high. And, uh, and, and then you'll have a relatively short time available to do something about it. So again, it's the, one of the real challenges with this is having good data uh, soon enough to be able to make a good decision about doing something about it. So the issues are when, when is action required and who makes the decision to act or not act? This is getting away from the engineering aspects or the scientific side. Uh, who pays for the deflection effort? And that can be an issue. Matter of fact, when I held the first conference in, uh, I asked a, a member of parliament in the UK to come over and be a keynote speaker for us. And I asked ask him a question about that, you know, and he says, oh, well, I think the UK and the US ought to pay for it. But, uh, you know, I imagine there are people in the US who would say that that's not the right way for doing that either. Uh, and also, um, there's another one down here. Uh, let's see, maybe maybe one is the, the, some of these things might be small. It's not going to. It won't impact in our area. Um, is, does that affect our decision to go off and, and uh, get involved? And so there's some some of these things are uh, really quite interesting to think about. Uh, how do you coordinate the international efforts? And Rusty has done a nice job of trying to help move that forward. The and the Association of Space and, uh, Space Explorers has. Um, and how do you, and, and we may not see a, an impact, and we haven't seen a significant impact since uh, 1908. We not, may not see another one for another 100 years. How do you maintain, uh, what, what is the strategy for maintaining capability? That's another interesting issue. And then are nuclear explosives acceptable? We had a conference in Europe, uh, the one that was in Spain, and I had a session chair who was um, you know, a, from someone from Europe, and, I, and he basically wanted to exclude all papers relative to using nuclear weapons because they just don't like nuclear weapons. And so um, I sort of overruled that because, you know, again, if knowing how human nature is, uh, we may wait to the last minute where the only thing we have a choice to use is a nuclear weapon. So, you, and it's a, it's a very capable device, so you just can't throw it away uh, based on public opinion. I think the leadership should have the best information to make that decision. 
And then uh, false alarms are another one. Uh, if we happen to go off and start early to try to do something with it and it goes away, it abysses, what do we do about that? So these are just some of the kind of the non-technical issues that we'll need to deal with as we go forward. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about deflection and uh, this, is, this one basically says, well, the objective is to have the asteroid and the Earth not be in the same place at the same time. It's, it's interesting, I, I did gave a talk similar to this one in India one time and somebody got up and asked, well, why don't we just move the Earth? So I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that one for you to think about. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea about why another reason why time is important. The closer it gets, the more uh, delta V is required to move it or to deflect it away from us. And so you're, we're paying a price for waiting on these things. And so uh, the idea of getting it early is good if you can convince people to spend the money to get it early. And so uh, that's a really a challenge that we'll face, but you can see how that varies as you would expect. It gets a lot higher as you get closer. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the techniques that have been proposed for doing this type of thing. Uh, the gravity tractor is an interesting one. This is a, a slow push technique, we call it, because it acts over a long time. And basically the idea is to plant a spacecraft nearby and, um, and basically have the, the very small gravitational attraction slowly pull the near-Earth object uh, into a, uh, an orbit that doesn't threaten anymore. It does require long warning times because the thing's going to need to be in place for a while. You, of course, would have to rendezvous and station keep for a good period of time as well. This is another one that might be interesting to a group like this. This is one that uh, actually would land these little minor spacecraft on a, an asteroid and you see, see a number of them here, but basically they, they, they take material from the asteroid and, and boot it off at a high speed and, and basically create uh, you know, a, a velocity change in that, in that fashion. And then of course the question would be with something like this is suppose your asteroid is rotating, then what? And that, that rotational business is, also, is a real issue that needs to be considered. And that's one reason why I think they use multi, multiple devices here. Um, a kinetic impulse, uh, the kinetic impact is one where you basically hit it with something fast or blow something up ne next to it and basically act on it very quickly. Uh, this would be similar to uh, the deep impact mission, that's what this is a photo of, um, where we uh, hit a, a, a comet with a, uh, a mass at, a, at about 10 kilometers per second and actually did change its velocity a very, very, very tiny amount. The, um, and then, then there's one, one benefit from that that you, you can get, but it's not predictable perhaps, uh, the, that's that the, when you throw stuff out of the crater, you actually get a little bit of an amplification in the um, uh, amount of uh, momentum transfer and that's useful. Okay, so one of the things that, uh, that my company did was look at um, uh, using a, uh, we had proposed for the first conference that we would have a, an asteroid and uh, we worked with JPL to set up a, a case where it was a 200 meter asteroid coming in and so we were looking at, uh, or this particular team was looking at how you would take that out and, um, and so they worked out a, a scheme using a, a, a small uh, uh, interceptor with a, a nuclear explosive on it that would be set off above the surface of the asteroid. Um, there's some work that says that if you uh, if you set it off above the surface of the asteroid, it won't disturb the, sur it won't disturb the asteroid so much. And one of the, again, one of the concerns would be if you've got an asteroid that's a conglomerate of a number of smaller bodies, um, if you broke it into pieces, that may not be exactly what you want to do either because that means if you have to do any subsequent missions, you've now got to deal with more than one, uh, potentially of objects that are of, of different sizes, and uh, that might not be, might not be good either. Um, and, oh, and by the way, one of the things, just to, just to kind of amplify on that one a bit, one of our goals in that particular study, you know, aerospace does mission designs for Air Force missions all the time. And, and so um, launch, launch vehicles, as you probably know, have a failure rate of about one in 100. And new spacecraft would fail, fail at around one in three, depending on what it's doing. And so um, uh, the, the idea that you can use one launch vehicle and one spacecraft is probably not right if you really want to lower the probability by a, a probability of impact by a, doing a campaign of some kind. And we found that you'd have to have uh, basically two companies working totally independently, not talking to each other to make sure that we don't, they don't transfer bad coordinate systems and things. And, um, and so you'd have to have two companies working uh, totally separately, building uh, each one building six interceptors to hope to, so that you'd hope to have to get one on uh, get one on station to lower the probability down below one in a million of impact. So again, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that side of the house as well, just the overall campaign design. 
Okay, I'll just talk a little bit about the uh, 2011 uh, Planetary Defense Conference. This was held in Romania. You see the, some of the sponsors there. And one of the goals has, to be get, has been to get all of the spacefaring nations uh, to be sponsors, and we're moving very close to getting that, and I, that's a really good thing. Um, had 160 in attendees, and uh, there's a really growing uh, interest in this topic all over the world. So some of the, th uh, th the, the highlights are here. Uh, there have been no, no threats identified this century from objects larger than a kilometer. That's good. Uh, most frequent damaging threat is from smaller objects, a lot less than 50 meters in diameter. Uh, we've got about 350 that discovered but with small but non-zero probability of impact this century. That's an interesting fact. Uh, two known objects with diameters of 100 meters of impact probabilities of, as you say, it's probably gone up now, Rusty, but in the, in the less than, say, less than 1 in 4,000 range. Um, the Tunguska class disaster right now could occur with little or no warning because we're really not tracking these small objects, the 50 meter ones right, uh, yet, although a number are being discovered. And uh, th there's some discussion of a, uh, of a wide sky search system that could provide maybe a one to three month warning time on some of these smaller objects that might be uh, useful to look at as well. So on the discovery side, there are about 990 plus or minus 35 NEOs greater than one kilometer in diameter. Uh, let's see, about 80% of the objects are larger than 140 meter, but smaller than one kilometer are undiscovered. That's interesting because uh, that's where a big part of our problem is, or potential problem. And then we've, there are a number of other things here. We're making a lot of progress on these things for objects larger than 300 meters. Uh, keyholes are something we're learning more about, and, uh, and human missions, uh, or even these kind of missions you're talking about, which would uh, you actually move something, may, may really help uh, in the future. Uh, deflection and disruption, uh, we talked about a, a number of those and then some concepts are coming in which, uh, which are showing some promise. Nuclear devices is really looked at as a necessary technique for objects with short warning times. And uh, there was some discussion, remember I mentioned how do you maintain a long-term capability. So one of the topics uh, was, that was brought up by uh, a student as it turned out was um, basically developing and maintaining a catalog of critical items for, a, for building a, an interceptor type spacecraft and uh, keeping that available, not trying to build the interceptor spacecraft, but to make sure you, got the, you maintain the capability to do that. Civil defense is another one that's talked about, for, particularly for short warning times, and uh, so our next conference is going to have more work, uh, more discussions from people that specialize in that topic. Um, and as we just did with this reentry event, um, I was looking at that one as an opportunity to, to help people understand how these things work and, you know, what we know and don't know about those. And, um, and as you said, I'll be happy to answer some questions after that, if you, after this, if you like. Um, and we'll, as I say, we'll have more focus on that stuff. Public education, we're developing some new tools, and I think Nahum is going to maybe show you one in a bit. And um, students are interested, so that's a good thing, and might be also something used to be included in planetarium things. Uh, there were three uh, sets of recommendations, and you can sort of see what those are. Um, we, that we really should start working on uh, these uh, impact threats of smaller near-Earth objects and dealing with these short warning times. That's going to be a challenge for us, and we need to have some options for dealing with that. And so there have been some proposals for um, actually doing some uh, campaign designs against a short warning time type of object. The, um, nothing's funded yet, however, which is a challenge in this business. Maybe it is as it is in the one you're talking about as well. Uh, funding for planetary defense uh, in this country is very, is very low. Uh, Europeans are stepping it up a little bit, but still probably not an, enough to really make significant strides. Uh, let's see, other, we should encourage other nations to participate. Uh, let's see, and, there, and also one of the ideas to put a sensor interior of the Earth's orbit so that we can discover these, those with uh, Earth-like and interior orbits. Uh, let's see, we need to conduct surveys. Uh, let's see what else here. Oh, one of the issues is um, if one of these things hits, how, much, well, how does the energy transport into the atmosphere, uh, and what, well, how would that affect things? And that's, uh, we've looked at tsunamis and creation of tsunamis and such, but, you know, you, it hits the water, and then you start to get the tsunamis going, but what happens to the energy that goes up? That's something that we should be looking at. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then a few others here. Uh, some, you, you, uh, calling for university and amateur telescopes. Um, uh, quick reassignment submissions. Oh yeah, one of the ideas would be to, that we, if we actually had a short-term warning, that we'd have to basically take launch vehicles on, on the, that are currently on the pad and utilize them for this type of thing. So that would be something to be looked at like as well. Uh, let's see, just for those who are interested, the next one's going to be in Flagstaff, 
and we're always looking for good presentations, so I invite any of you to think about that, and um, we'll try to get information up on the web pages about this one pretty soon. But uh, it's going to be sponsored by NASA. We're going to in tour, include a tour of Meteor Crater, so if you haven't been there, it would be a nice thing to visit. And um, uh, so it should be quite a nice conference. And again, you know, maybe that would be some incentive. We normally do provide some scholarships for people too, but that would be something to think about. Okay, so just in summary, interest in increasing worldwide. Um, there's general recognition that uh, the nearest, the near-term threat, the greatest near-term threat is from the smaller objects. Um, it's possible that a planetary defense, defense mission may be required this century. And again, if, 600, if 1 in 650 is distasteful, maybe it's something we be, need to be thinking about. Uh, there are many opportunities for research here, and uh, you can see that we're going to cover, have a good spectrum of topics at the next conference, so I invite you to come to that. I think that's it. And thank you. <laughs> Shall we see if we can play those little videos? Let me do that, see here, real quick. Okay, so this one, this is the one that it plays, yeah, so let me blow it up a bit. Okay, this is one that came in over uh, New York. This looks like a, a spacecraft reentry. This is, and this, this uh, uh, breakup that you see here is what you might expect for a spacecraft as well. Keep watching. That's peak skill, yeah. See? Perfect target. <laughs> and it hit the car. I don't know why it stopped there, but anyway, it did. <laughs> I hope you're watching that one. Okay, let's see here. And uh, then this one, this is the one from the police car. Oops, this is real time. Interesting computer. And then, uh, and this last one is, uh, uh, this is the one that, if, if we can see it, will be uh, an interesting one to look at. This is one that was uh, basically, uh, we showed at the conference. And how do we start this silly thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, you want to look at full screen? I can do it up here. Okay. You want to do what now? Okay. Ah, there we go. Good, thanks. Okay, so what this is showing is, um, if you can see it, maybe not as well as I might like, but um, this is the uh, asteroid discovered since 1980. And let me move this over a little bit so you can see the year. If I can figure out what doing that without killing it. Maybe not. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay, so you just kind of watch the year go there, and the second number is the number of uh, known asteroids. And the white spots, when they appear, are new discoveries. And uh, that outer orbit is Jupiter, and so you'll notice that um, there are a number of discoveries uh, associated with uh, observations of Jupiter when Jupiter shows up. Uh, if you look at it on the, on the web, that you can actually see Jupiter's orbit, so it becomes a little clearer. clearer. The red ones are uh, ones that uh, are potentially a threat to Earth. The yellow ones are ones where it comes, you know, it comes within 1.3 AU, I guess it is, or uh, have perigees of 1.3 AU or less. Yeah. So this is 88, and basically there was a, a NASA, uh, Congress directed NASA to begin a survey of looking for these things. Um, when was that, 1990-ish, Rusty? Uh, 1988. Yeah, so you'll notice that there's a, a big jump in the discovery rate once they came online. And then in, uh, in, two, in 2010, you'll see Ys kick in, and it's got these uh, bow tie, it's got a, like a bow tie uh, look to the uh, discoveries. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I can't see it from here very well, but it doesn't seem to be showing up too well. So I suggest you look at it on the web. You can get a relatively high, a high uh, definition version there as well. But if you've ever seen these pictures of space debris surrounding Earth, uh, it looks like we are one of these debris pieces, uh, you know, surrounding the sun, so. So that's 97, 1997 now. That's not always 
Always been there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's a good thing we're looking, I think. When it, uh, the, the white, yeah, the white objects are new discoveries. The green are known. Once they, they, they flash white and then they meld into the green background. Ah, uh, yeah. I guess they tell you about one, one second on this, uh, on this video is about uh, 60 days. <laughs> the dots are how big? Uh, yeah. Good question. They can be any, a, a lot of sizes. Probably a, better than about, I would say better than about 40 meters. And if you go on the JPL page, you can see um, they've got a nice, uh, nice set of objects there that are representative of the size. And there's Y's coming in there now. So that's it, and, there's, and we're still finding more, so the game's not over yet. Uh, okay. Let me figure out how to kill this thing. Ah. Okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions, yes. Thank you.